Good morning. Happy Friday. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I sure appreciate your hard work and this crazy week. Uh, next Monday at 1.10, when you come to class uh, lab, we won't do problem set six, we won't have quiz six, but we'll take the second midterm exam. Uh, midterm exam this time is over chapters 9, 10, and 11. So nine is the gas laws, 10 is intermolecular forces, solids, liquids, stuff like that. Uh, 11 is solutions, all right, so colligative properties, um, freezing point depression, blowing point elevation, osmosis, that kind of stuff. When you come on Monday, all right, make sure that you bring the lab with you. Uh, exam prep worksheet two will be up. Take home quiz five is due that you got a copy of this on Monday. And also bring a copy of the Kinetics One lab. We'll do that afterwards. It's pretty chill lab. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard or anything like that. On the midterm, you can absolutely, of course, have a calculator, your table, and you can definitely bring a page of notes. One page paper, everything handwritten, both sides are fine. Staple it to the back when you're done. Good to go. Uh, the exam will be about two hours in length. Uh, when I return it to you the following week, there'll be a summary sheet on the end saying how you're doing in the class as of this time. There's a sample midterm exam uh, on the website and also in the companion that you can check out to kind of see the kind of questions uh, you might run into. Taking care of business time. Any questions? Anything like this? So we're going to continue talking about some questions you might see. Uh, on Wednesday, we basically looked at the gas law stuff. And now what we'll start doing is looking at intermolecular forces. And to understand, at least to a level, why compounds boil and freeze at different temperatures, it's really helpful to think about the intermolecular forces. So I'd like you to put these in order of decreasing boiling points, all right? Now, <clears throat> boiling point depends on intermolecular forces, absolutely. So think about those when you answer this question, all right? So order of decreasing boiling points. So the highest boiling point first, lowest boiling point last. So intermolecular forces are forces between molecules. They're not the forces inside the molecules, which are be like ionic and covalent bonds. These are the forces between like two water molecules or between two methane molecules or whatever. And to understand how strong those forces are that hold the molecules together, there's like a strength list, if you will. Um, the strongest intermolecular forces are always the ion-ion and metallic forces. There's actually subdivisions in there, but we don't need to worry about that. Those are always the strongest. So sodium chloride, super strong. All right, metallic, sodium would be strong too. Ion dipole keeps the um, ions dissolved in water, and that's also a really strong force too. 
dipole-dipole, which means two polar pieces coming together would be next. Of course, if you have hydrogen bonds, which are O, uh, F, and N connect to hydrogen, that's super strong. And once in a while people ask, well, which one's stronger, hydrogen bonding or ion dipole? And I won't ask you those kind of questions because that's a really loaded thing in the chemistry world. Just know that it's like supercharged dipole-dipole. Then there's dipole-induced dipole, keeps the fish breathing because oxygen goes in water, i.e. a nonpolar substance, which is what induced dipole means, goes in something polar, which is the dipole part. And then the weakest of all is induced dipole, induced dipole. So there's three compounds here. We can first start by putting these in order of increasing our strongest intermolecular force to weakest intermolecular force. Strongest intermolecular force will hold on to each other, so it would make it harder to boil. And if you look at all of these, methanol, CH3OH, if you drew out the Lewis structure, you'd have the oxygen with the two lone pairs. It would certainly be polar, tetrahedral slash bent, but even more importantly, it has an OH. So not only is it polar, which is always dipole-dipole, this has the OH or NH or FH bonds. So this one would be hydrogen bonded, and that's a pretty strong force. Now, H2, completely non-symmetric, it's gonna be non-polar. Two hydrogens pulling on each other, that's non-polar. Non-polar would be induced dipole, induced dipole. And if you drew out the Lewis structure for methane, CH4, tetrahedral carbon, everything around is hydrogen, also non-polar. So every, uh, I'm hoping that you see that if you're looking for the biggest boiling point, which would be listed first, definitely going to be methanol. All right, it's got the strongest intermolecular force, uh, which is going to make it really, we saw how water with really small molar mass is higher than a lot of its corresponding uh, group six uh, compounds and stuff. Very, very strong. Now, the next part then comes down to CH4 and H2, and they're both nonpolar. They're both induced dipole, induced dipole. So if you have a tie like this, which is what you have, the other part about boiling point is molar mass. Because as molar mass gets bigger, it's harder to throw the pieces in the air and make them gases. So if you figure out the grams per mole of CH4 and H2, well, H2 is about two grams per mole. CH4 with a carbon and four hydrogens would be about 16 grams per mole. So CH4 has a bigger molar mass. It should be a little harder to boil than little tiny hydrogen, which should be the easiest. So if we're gonna put these in order of decreasing boiling points, Methanol would certainly be the biggest. Hydrogen bonds, really strong, hard to get rid of. However, when it comes to these two, they're both ID, ID. Then you go to molar mass, all right? And CH4 is about 16 grams per mole, while hydrogen is about two grams per mole. So it'll be easier to throw hydrogen in the air. It's gonna be harder to make that go to a liquid, basically. Any questions on that? So this is the same kind of problem, more or less. Just put these in order of increasing intermolecular forces. So I've got the list up here. Uh, think about what the intermolecular forces are for each one of those compounds. We'll put them in increasing order. So the weakest first, the strongest will be last. Let's see what you can do with it.
reasons why I wanted to ask this question is I, I want to talk a little bit about what sodium chloride is. Good old table salt that you put on your french fries. You probably shouldn't put salt on anything, but if you do, which I do, um, yeah, sodium chloride all around us all the time. But let's talk about what kind of bonds it has. So Na and Cl, do you think it's more covalent or ionic? Ionic, all right. And ionic is ion ion. So anytime you see a metal, all right, metals get pushed right up to the top because it's either going to be pure sodium, pure magnesium, which would be metallic, or it's going to be ion ion. So of all of those up there, that's the only compound with a metal. So we're going to have to have the NaCl be at the very end here, all right? That's the strongest one. So again, seeing a metal should put off an alarm in your mind, say, oh wow, that's going to be ionic, ion, ion is strongest, stuff like that. So if NaCl is the strongest, all right, you can probably, see it's going to be B or C. You can see then that probably helium is going to be the weakest, and it is because little helium is about as non-polar as you can get all right, of all the compounds known. So helium is gonna be induced dipole, induced dipole. It's the opposite of strong ionic bonding. So what it comes down to then, if NaCl is strongest and helium's the weakest, it's these two right here. Now, what did we say that methanol had in the last slide? What kind of bonding? Hydrogen, Hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is one of the stronger ones, okay? Sulfur dioxide uh, initially might appear to be like carbon dioxide, but if you really want to knock this problem out, good old Lewis structure. So sulfur is six, oxygen six, so there's two of them. That's 18 electrons, nine pairs. Sulfur in the middle of the oxygen, the outer ones get the octet first, one lone pair in the middle and you can make formal charges better by putting two double bonds. That's not a big deal here. What is important, your sulfur is not symmetric, all right? It has a lone pair and two oxygens. So this is gonna be polar. It's gonna have dipole, dipole. So of those then, helium is gonna be induced dipole, induced dipole, the weakest. Sulfur dioxide is polar, but it doesn't have that almost magical OH and FH bond, so it'll be just dipole, dipole. But methanol certainly does have it. That'll be the stronger one. And then NaCl, ion ion, will be the strongest of all. So I put these questions up there just to help you see the kind of patterns you might think. Um, the ionic one is one I wanted to make very clear that, yeah, if you see the ions, those are the strongest. Like sodium chloride doesn't even melt until 800 degrees. And helium is a gas down to four degrees, uh, Kelvin, four Kelvin. And uh, whoa, so yeah. Uh, anyway, crazy anabolic forces. Questions? Potassium chloride is available at Safeway. It's called no salt or something like that. Bottom ones from my grandfather, long story short. But anyway, potassium chloride, like sodium chloride, dissolves in water. Uh, you still see, see the solid one. So anyway, what kind of intermolecular bonds are formed when KCl is placed in water? All right, see if you can figure out which of those that would be. It's not natural. Like getting, getting married. The bonds of matrimony. It's incredibly dark. Sorry. No tomatoes. This is me too.
Okay, so potassium chloride, potassium a metal, chlorine a non-metal, that's going to be ionic. So KCl is actually pretty strong, ion, ion. And water is not only dipole, dipole, polar, but hydrogen bonded, also pretty strong. But we don't really care about the ion, ion, and hydrogen bonds here. We want to know what happens when the KCl dissolves in water. And in Chem 221, and also recently then, KCl ionic compounds, if they dissolve, they not only go into the water, but they actually dissociate into K plus and Cl minus. And this is the real power of water that it can break up these strong bonds like this. But if you think about what happens then, you have a positive ion in water and you have a negative ion in water. So something ionic and something polar, i.e. with a dipole, this is an example of the ion dipole force. So if you see an ionic compound, it dissolves in water, that means that the ion dipole force is in the compound. Now, if you have a compound like, uh, that's not a good example, uh, magnesium sulfide, that's a compound that doesn't dissolve well in water. Then you can argue that the ion-ion forces are stronger than the ion dipole that would form, uh, so that wouldn't apply. But here, anything sodium, potassium, lithium, it's going to dissolve. So anything ionic that dissolves in water is ion dipole? Yes, that's right. Exactly. That's right. Good. If you have, like, acetone, which dissolves. Acetone is covalent. Um, that would be then dipole, dipole. Like you've got something polar acetone with something polar water. But the ions, you bet. Questions on that? Okay. Now, intermolecular forces apply in some strange ways, and this is actually one of them. Delta H. VAP is heat of vaporization. It's the energy required to turn liquid into a gas. And there's four possibilities up here. The question is, which one should have the highest delta H VAP value? Now, you could look this up on Google, but of course, if you're in an exam or something, you can't do that. So what I want you to do here is think about, though, again, the intermolecular forces and see which of those should be the strongest. And we've talked about one of those compounds quite a bit, so hopefully that will be a hint to as to what's going on. So the answer is not E, all right, they're different, all right. So of the four uh, possibilities we have, one of those has a different intermolecular force from the other three. Which one is that? F2, that's right. The F2 is fluorine, it's nonpolar, two Fs pulling on each other. Anything that's nonpolar is gonna have the weakest intermolecular force, induced dipole, induced dipole. So of these choices, that would be the least likely one that we would predict would be the highest, okay? And as people were saying, which is really cool, B, C, and D are all hydrogen bonds, all right? Methanol has an OH. Water has not just one OH, but two OHs. And of course, ammonia has NH, which is another one there. 
So this is where it gets a little crazy because they're all hydrogen bonds. <clears throat> But one thing that we talked about very briefly is how water has not only two OHs, but two lone pairs. And they feel that the lone pair is what connects to the hydrogen of the hydrogen bond to make these things possible. So for an example here, if you draw a Lewis structure for uh, water, the two lone pairs here, it's the lone pair which connects to the hydrogen. And why water is so freaking awesome, and basically the theme of Chem 221 and Chem 223, in my opinion, is because water can technically bind with two waters from the same molecule, two lone pairs. Now, ammonia has one lone pair and three NHs. So it has more hydrogen bonds, the NH, but it only has the one pair, and HF, Thanks for playing. Methanol is just the OH. Uh, it's stronger, but it only has one OH, while water has two OHs. So if you have to bet on a hydrogen bond, it's almost always water. And I don't believe you, Dr. Russell. That's totally fine, I understand. Look the values up if you have access to the internet. And so that's what I did in this problem. Notice how intermolecular force ID. ID is the lowest, all right? It's heat of vaporization for fluorine is pretty small. And all of these hydrogen bond ones are pretty strong. But wow, water like stands out above the crowd for some reason. Water, we're really lucky on the earth to have liquid water around because it does all these amazing things between the hydrogen bonds and the high heat capacity. Yeah, life. Okay, all right, pop that back on. Too much caffeine. Questions on? Here's a problem where we're looking at a crystal structure. Now, <clears throat> there's gray atoms and there's red atoms. There's a unit cell in blue. And the hint here is that all of the gray atoms are inside the cell. The red atoms are oxygen and the gray atoms are copper. And what I would like you to do is based on this unit cell, figure out the formula of this copper oxide. Now copper is a variable charged metal, it can be all over the place, but using this unit cell, see if you can figure out what's happening. So I want you to count atoms and I want you to think about how much of some of those atoms are actually inside the unit cell. So see what you can do.
Okay. So if you look at this weird structure that I've thrown up there, there are one, two, three, four gray atoms. All right, one, two, there's three back there and four, and those are copper. So that means there are four coppers. And if you look at the number of red ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there's nine oxygens. So it's tempting, perhaps, to put down Cu409 as your answer. But when we talked about the body-centered cubic, and the simple cubic, and the face-centered cubic, we talked about how the corner atoms, not all of them are within the unit cell. So for example, if we look at this one, this is right on that corner. How much of this atom technically is inside the unit cell? Two. Well, two point five. Like the corners are only an eight. An eight, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. Remember how we talked about if you take like a, a chainsaw, mm -hmm. sound effects not necessary, and you shave off the outsides, all right? Only one eighth of those atoms technically is inside the cell. All right, this corner right here is connected to a total of eight unit cells. So there's one coming out of here, there's one there to the left, one to the right, and there's also four on top. So when you see a corner atom like that, they aren't totally inside the cell. They're only one eighth inside the cell. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those are, those eight oxygens are one eighth inside the cell and seven eighths of them belong to other unit cells. So they represent just one oxygen, okay? Those corner ones are one eighth inside. If we had a face atom, which would be like right there, that would be half in the unit cell, like a face centered cubic, but we don't have any of those in this problem. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I didn't talk about this one right here, and that one is within the other copper ones. So this one is totally inside the cell, all right? So eight times one eighth is one. You've got one more that's totally inside. You've got two oxygens. So initially, it looks like Cu4O2, all right? That's not one of the possibilities. So this is kind of like a body-centered cubic cell. We talked about how there are two atoms in a body-centered cubic. Well, in this problem, if you divide both of these by two, Cu2O is gonna be the empirical formula. There's two of these inside the unit cell. And uh, the reason I bring this up is just to remind you that these are only one eighth inside the cell. Most of them's outside, all right? If you had a face one, those would be half in and half out, but we don't have any of those here. Um, so one eight times eight is one net atom. You've still got the one oxygen inside, so there's two net oxygens, and one, two, three, four coppers are in there. It's usually a smallest formula, so C2O would be the best one here. Another thing we talked about were phase diagrams. And we've got this one is for oxygen. And the question is, what's the name of the point at a pressure of two millimeters of mercury and 54.34 Kelvin? And see if you can figure out which of those would be the best names. There. It's not the freak out point. I know I'm feeling kind of freaky this morning, but uh, that's not what it is. Okay.
outstanding. Uh, everybody saw it. Good. This is the triple point. And all compounds, in theory anyway, have a triple point. All three phases are around the same time. And I, it's really a cool concept because we're used to seeing, you know, liquids freeze. And we're used to seeing liquids turn into gas, especially for water. But at the triple point, you'd have all three of them, solid, liquid, and gases all together, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, the normal freezing point and the normal boiling point are what happens at one atmosphere of pressure. And remember that 760 millimeters of mercury is an atmosphere. So if you go along this line, uh, the place where you get to the solid liquid interface, that would be the normal freezing point. And if you keep going here, where you go from liquid to gas or vapor, that would be the normal boiling point, which is kind of cool. Um, critical point is uh, something we haven't talked about. It's when you get to super high pressures and temperatures. Sometimes you could make these things go other cool things. Uh, they decaffeinate coffee. You could put it in soft drinks that way. But we haven't talked about it, so don't worry about it. And of course, freak out point. Uh, I'm going to try and keep you away from that. Questions on any of that? Now, here's another kind of question. We've got a phase diagram for O2. And I'd like you to figure out which of those statements would be correct regarding the densities of solid and liquid oxygen at the same temperature. Now remember, we talked about in problem set uh, five a little bit, the slope of this line. So see if you can use that information and those numbers to see which one of those statements is correct. Outstanding. More dense things go to the bottom, less dense things go to the top. So a piece of a rock you throw in water, the rock usually goes to the bottom because rocks are generally more dense than water. On the other hand, you put a plastic bottle or something, most of those will flow because the densities of plastics are usually less than water. So more dense to the bottom, less dense to the top. Here we have two numbers, all right? This is a bigger density, this is a smaller density. So whatever the bigger density is, that's gonna be the one that goes to the bottom and the smaller density will go to the top. All right, now most compounds uh, have uh, solids more dense than liquids. So if you put, uh, say, solid iron in liquid iron, uh, it goes to the bottom. And water, this weekend, if you get an ice cube and you put it in, it's actually really cool that an ice cube floats. That's very rare because, again, most compounds, the solid is more dense than the liquid. And so everybody saw that, yeah, this solid number is bigger than the liquid density, so that's more likely to occur. Now, how you can nail it is look at the slope of the solid liquid line. And if the solid liquid line is a positive slope, if it increases up to the right, the solid, I think of it as pushing on the liquid. And it's, I don't know if that, that works for me for some reason, I don't know. But anyway, uh, most compounds are that way. So they'll have a positive solid liquid line, and that's the way to tell if your solid is more dense than the liquid. Water is one of the few compounds that has a negative slope, all right? It may not be that pronounced, but it goes like up and to the left. That means that the uh, liquid phase is more dense than the solid phase, and that's why the ice cubes float. Uh, if nothing else, I want you to appreciate the fact that, whoa, ice cubes floating on water, like David's drink, I think he's got ice cubes in there. It's, it's actually kind of a cool phenomena, and uh, anyway, woohoo, life, yeah. All right, caffeine's kicking. Questions? Okay. Now, <clears throat> Here's another kind of question. If you have a phase diagram, you can find the matter, the phase of matter at anything at any kind of conditions. 
So what I'd like you to do is tell what phase oxygen is found out at one millimeter of mercury and 55 Kelvin. Now this is hardly the world's best graph, but you can figure out what it is uh, based on that information. So see if you can figure out which of those phases it would be in under those conditions. So uh, to read this, pressure is the Y and temperature is the X. 55 Kelvin, there's not a specific part, but you can see it's to the right of this one, so maybe right there or so. But one millimeter mercury, this is two millimeters mercury, so one would be about there. You're gonna go over this way, you're crossing through the solid gas or solid vapor line. So about, I would think that point would be right around there, and that's definitely the gas or vapor phase. Yeah, nice job. And this is why it's nice to have a phase diagram. You can tell quickly what any substance will be, what phase it is uh, quickly. Believe it or not, plasma is actually a fourth state of matter. And we're gonna talk about the plasma a little bit uh, at the very end of this class. But it is actually another state of matter, like solids, liquids, and gases. Believe it or not, it's actually the most abundant phase of matter in the universe. But on the Earth, solids, liquids, and gases rule. We'll talk about that more coming in. Questions on anything but plasma? So, this is the kind of question you might run into. This question is about finding the energies of transitions. And what we have here is we have a liter of ethanol, liquid ethanol, and we want to turn it into a gas at 78.3 degrees. So we're starting with a liquid. We want to end at a gas at 78.3, and its boiling point is 78.3. So what you're going to do here is do a two-step calculation, MC delta T to raise your liquid to the boiling point, and then heat times uh, mass of something to find the energy to turn that liquid into a gas. So see what you can do. Remember, the numbers are in kilojoules. It is not zero kilojoules, darn it, thermodynamics. Anyway, see what you can do here. We'll talk about it.
So when you see a problem like this, I really recommend making some kind of a map, whatever this means to you, to kind of show you the steps that you need to conquer it. When you're just heating up a compound, but you're not changing the phase, that's MC delta T, uh, which we talked about in Chem 221. M is the mass, usually grams. C is the heat capacity. In this case, that's this number right here. And delta T can be Kelvin or Celsius. I recommend using Celsius just because you don't have to convert anything. Final minus initial. So mass times C times delta T. That'll be the heat to require to heat the ethanol from 25 to 78.3. But then at 78.3, which is the boiling point, that's when the liquid turns into a gas. And that's a separate calculation, which I'll call Q2. It's the mass times heat. Heat is all over the place. Uh, you've got, this is the heat right here, heat of vaporization. Sometimes it's heat of sublimation, heat of all kinds of things, condensation, whatever, it's heat of something, all right? And the units of the heats are all over the place too. So this one's in kilojoules per mole. Uh, so you're gonna have to turn your grams into moles, blah, blah, blah. So you're gonna have Q1 here and Q2 here. You wanna add them up together. And if you get answer D, 759 kilojoules, right on. Now, oh my gosh, Russell, you're throwing weird things at me. I can't handle it. I totally understand. If you have to guess, all right, usually zero doesn't make any sense because nothing takes zero energy as far as I know. Um, however, in this problem, we're going from a solid to a liquid. And anytime you go solid to liquid or liquid to gas, like liquid to gas in this case, excuse me, um, that's going to take energy. You have to break those intermolecular forces. Those are always endothermic, positive numbers, all right? I don't say always a lot, but I, I will say it here. I'll like get myself in trouble sometimes for saying always. I'll probably have back on. Anyway, solid to liquid, liquid to gas, always endothermic, always positive numbers. Conversely, gases to liquids, liquids to solids, as far as anybody knows, always exothermic. So if you had to guess, guess a positive number, all right, definitely. But when you do the math, it comes out to be D. got time for one more question, I think. Um, we're taking 92 grams of ethanol and we're placing it in 270 grams of water. What's the mole fraction of ethanol in this solution? So mole fraction is one of the types of units, concentration units we use with solutions. See if you can figure out what the mole fraction of the ethanol will be.
I'm running out of time, so I have to stop this a little faster. Um, mole fraction, always a number between zero and one. Zero would be no ethanol at all, so that's not correct. And answer two would be in the logical for a mole fraction. Mole fraction can be no bigger than one. So what you want to do here is to figure out the moles of ethanol and the moles of water. Moles of ethanol on top, you divide it by total moles, which would be moles of ethanol plus moles of water. At OH, by the way, is an abbreviation for ethanol from organic chemistry. Sorry, I didn't talk about that earlier. But anyway, if you do this right, it comes out to be 0.12. Uh, we'll start with this problem on Friday, and we'll go through some examples about different types of concentration units. Nice. Thanks you for being here. Any questions? Have a great day.